Elon, what egg hatched you into this world? <laughs> Where were you before you? Well, I was born in South Africa. Born in South Africa, yeah. and you come to America and make a billion dollars. Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect to make a billion dollars, I suppose. Um, <laughs> I mean, I grew up in South Africa, honestly, seeing a lot of the same TV and movies and reading comic books, and, and it really didn't feel all that different from, say, Southern California, honestly. So you had you a know? kind of baptism into American pop culture at the time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I ate a lot of hamburgers and went to steakhouses and read, like, every comic book, you know. So my father brought me on a trip to the United States when I think I was about 10. I remember it was a really awesome experience because the hotels all had arcades. So my number one thing was when we went to a new hotel or motel or whatever it is, go to the arcades. And so the, they had forget the, any other the, services, the, forget yeah. whether they had bed bugs. You're looking for arcade games. Yeah. What did video games do for you? I mean, they're incredibly engaging and they made me want to learn how to program computers. Because then I thought, well, I could make my own games and then I could also, uh, I wanted to see how the games work. Like, how did you create a video game? That's what led me to learn how to program computers. So you became yeah. a programmer? Yeah, so I had one of the first video game consoles. It didn't even have cartridges. It had like four games that you could play, and you could like pick one, one of the four games you could play. That was it. And then it went from there to the original Atari, and then in television. And then I was in a store and saw a, a Commodore VIC-20. And I was like, holy crow, you can actually have a computer and make your own games. I thought this was just one of the most incredible things possible. Took all, all of my saved allowance and, and then hounded my father until we got the Commodore VIC-20. And that came with this manual on how to program in BASIC, which I sort of spent all night, several days in a row, just absorbing that. And but, On your own? No one forced you? No. I would this was self-motivated, i got to know this. This is yeah. good for me. I must have been like 9, 9 or 10 or something. So you were uh, fluent in BASIC at age 9 or 10? Yeah. I kind of went, got OCD on the thing. Maybe it's not technically OCD, it's but I suddenly got obsessive. Let me put that, at least the O part. So programming is power. Else. You get to control something. Yeah, you can construct a little universe. And when you first do it, you're like, wow, this is incredible. You can actually make things happen. Like you type these commands and then something happens on the screen. That's pretty amazing. You know, when I was in college, I sort of thought, well, what are the things that are most going to affect the future of humanity? And you know, electric cars, solar power, essentially sustainable Most people are thinking, I just want a job when I get out. And you're trying to reshape yeah. humanity as an undergraduate. I mean, it's pretty, in America, it's pretty easy to keep yourself alive. So, I mean, my threshold for existing is pretty low. I mean, it's, I figured I could, like, be in some dingy apartment with my computer and be okay and not starve. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In fact, when I first came to North America, I was in Canada when I was 17. And just to sort of see what it takes to live, I'd try to live on $1 a day, which I was able to do. Wow. You sort of just buy food in bulk at the yeah, yeah. supermarket. Rice and, and beans and... Yeah, I went more for the uh, hot dogs, hot dogs, okay. <laughs> hot dogs and oranges. <laughs> but you do get really tired of hot dogs and oranges after a while. <laughs> and you can also like you know pasta and a green pepper and a big thing of sauce, and that can go pretty far too. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, you know, if I can live for a dollar a day, then at least from a food cost standpoint. Well, it's pretty easy to earn like thirty dollars in a month, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I would think. So it'll probably be okay. Okay, yeah. so, so that like, allowed you I, to not have to worry about money yeah, because you well, did the experiment. Yeah, I did the experiment exactly. So this was an important psychological, philosophical anchor for you. Not yeah. to put words in your mouth, but that's a starting point to launch anywhere you want to go. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so now you've got a baseline, a life baseline, from which to go new places, intellectually, psychologically, financially. So what came first, thoughts of an electric car or thoughts of space? Hmm. You know, when you're starting out in college, like in your freshman, sophomore year, like you have these sort of sophomoric philosophical wonderings. And I try to think of, okay, what are the things that it will seem to me would most affect the future of humanity? There were really five things, three of which I thought would be interesting to be involved in. The three that I thought were would definitely be positive would be the internet, sustainable energy, both production and consumption, and space exploration, more specifically, the extension of life beyond Earth on a permanent basis. And then Although I, I never thought I'd actually be involved in that. That's, that was simply something I thought that was important in the abstract, but not something I thought I would ever have an opportunity to be involved in. And then the fourth one was artificial intelligence, and the fifth one was rewriting human genetics. These were just the five things that I thought would most affect the future of humanity. When I started out, my goal was to do a philanthropic mission with the intent of increasing NASA's budget. That was my goal. I was confused as to why we'd not yet sent a person to Mars. It seemed like this was obviously the goal after the moon, and we'd not made progress on that. And when it became clear like that PayPal was going to get sold, 
a friend of mine asked me what I'm going to do next, and I said, well, I mean, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm always curious about what's going on with space and, and why have we made progress. I just wonder when we're going to send a person to Mars. So I went, I went on the NASA website, and I couldn't find a date. I was like, well, maybe it's here somewhere, and I just can't find it. The date that NASA, <laughs> the date that NASA wants to land on Mars. Yeah, there's got to be like, like some schedule or something. We're or, looking or for that. Or game plan, or mm -hmm. it's this date, even if it's far in the future, and it was not to be found anywhere. And anyways, I sort of started learning about that back history, and I thought, well, okay, maybe there's something that I can do to send a small mission to the surface of Mars that would get the public excited. And as a result of that public excitement, NASA's budget would be increased, and we could resume the process of sending people to Mars. Essentially, so you thought you can do that with your lousy billion dollars? No, I didn't have a billion dollars at that time. Okay. Um, I had about a well, 180 million, still a lot. And and I figured, well, you know, maybe I could spend half of that on a mission to Mars. So I spent a fair bit of time investigating the space industry and eventually decided on this idea of, of sending a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars, what we called the Mars Oasis mission. And so you have seeds and dehydrated gel that would land, you'd hydrate the gel upon landing, and you'd have this great shot of green plants on a red right background, and the public responds to precedents and support it. So this would be the first life on another planet, the furthest that life's ever traveled, as far as we know. And That's uh, how you get a headline. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got to be something new or mm -hmm. something superlative. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, okay, and that would maybe reinvigorate excitement, and the result would be NASA's budget gets increased. So the whole goal in the beginning was just how do we get more money for NASA? But after spending a fair bit of time on this, I came to the conclusion that I was actually incorrect. My initial assumption was wrong because I thought that where there's a will, there's a way, and that we just sort of lost our will. But that was that's false. There's plenty of will. People needed to believe that there was a way, and a way that would not bankrupt the country or mean that they would have to sacrifice something of critical importance like health care. So it became clear that the space transport problem had to be solved. Unless there was a dramatic improvement in the cost of space transport, then none of it would matter. So in your first successful launch, what was the cost per pound to orbit? Uh, about $6,000. $6,000. Okay, that's an improvement. Yeah, not bad. Not $100 a pound. No. To get to $100 a pound, you need a big rocket that's fully reusable. Are you there yet? No. <laughs> 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 We're making progress, though. It's been 12 years. So far, we've not recovered a stage. But I think we'll recover a stage within the next year and be able to reply. <laughs> Is there a date on your website where someone can say, oh, uh, he's going to land on Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. That sounds like a no. Well, I mean, I've said it publicly many times, although maybe we should put something on the website which is that I think we've got a decent shot of being able to send a person to Mars in about 11 or 12 years. From a terrestrial standpoint, the biggest problem we need to solve in Earth this century is sustainable production and consumption of energy. This really is quite a serious problem. People really should take this quite seriously. Even if you put the environmental consequences of dramatically changing the chemical composition of the oceans and atmosphere aside, we will eventually <laughs> run out of oil. Holding that aside. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't find a solution to burning oil for transport, and we then run out of oil, the economy will collapse and civilization will come to an end, or as we know it. Um, with or without global warming. Yeah, with or without, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. and so if we know that we have to ultimately get off oil no matter what, we know that that is an inescapable outcome. It's simply a question of when, not if. Then why would you run this crazy experiment of changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere and oceans by adding enormous amounts of CO2 that have been buried since the pre-Cambrian era. That's crazy. That is the dumbest experiment in history by far. But, <laughs> I mean, promise it's not can even you think a... of a dumber experiment? I honestly cannot. <laughs> <laughs> what good could possibly come of it? So therefore, we need another solution here. But of course, electric cars still uses coal. That's why you need sustainable power production, like solar and wind. Which and can still charge your, your car. Yes. Of course, what we all really want are flying cars. Do you? Um, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, let me ask you. So, are you sure you want a flying car? No, but it looks okay. cool. It does look cool. I mean, I, you know, whenever you see sort of cities and like some futuristic concept, they always throw the flying car in there. And um, You can't tell me you never thought of it. No, I thought a lot about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. And there's some people I know that are working on flying cars or flying personal transport devices, if you will. Hoverboards. Uh, there are people working on hoverboards. But, I mean, I, I sort of wonder... After the interview, you can show me your hoverboard room, okay? <laughs> I know someone's I working tell, on a hoverboard. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> the microphone is on mute now, okay. so you can tell <laughs> just between, Just between us. <laughs> it's awesome. 
I'm, I'm debating like, should there be flying cars or shouldn't there be flying cars? I'm of two minds on that, you know, because if there are flying cars, then, well, obviously you have added this additional dimension where now a car could potentially fall in your head and will be susceptible to weather. And of course you'd have to have a flying car where it would be like an autopilot because, I mean, otherwise forget it. You don't want people navigating. Yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to be autopilot. Mm -hmm. But even in an autopilot scenario, this, and even if you've got redundant motors and blades, you're still gone from near zero chance of something falling on your head to something greater than that. And there's also a noise challenge. So I see yeah, we don't know how to fly quietly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, so I'll wait it out some longer. Something that I do think would definitely help a lot in cities is more tunnels. Essentially with a flying car, you're talking about going 3D. And there's a fundamental flaw with cities where you've got dense office buildings and apartment buildings and duplexes, and they're operating on three dimensions, but then you go to the street and suddenly you're two-dimensional. Because it's a flat, it's a surface. Yeah. This is how New York City solved this with the subway, going right. underneath multiple right. layers of subway. Right. So we are actually traveling in three dimensions, but below the ground rather yes. than in the air. But I think if you were to extrapolate that to cars and have more car tunnels, then you would alleviate congestion completely. And cities. you wouldn't need the flying car. You would not need a flying car in that case. And it would always work even if the weather's bad. And it would never ice up. It would never ice up, and it would not fall in your head. <laughs> so we're going to get started on that right away. <laughs> I mean, I'm quite worried about artificial superintelligence these days. I think, and I've said this publicly, I think it's maybe something more dangerous than nuclear weapons. So uh, we should be really careful about that. If there was a very deep super digital superintelligence that was created that could go into rapid recursive self-improvement in a non-logarithmic way, then you know that was and it's self-learning. Yes. So like it just could reprogram itself to be smarter and iterate very quickly and do that 24 hours a day on millions of computers. Well, that, I then mean, that's all she wrote. That's, that's it. all she wrote. <laughs> okay. I mean, we will be like a pet Labrador if we're lucky. A pet. <laughs> I have a we'll pet Labrador, the, by the we'll way. We'll be their pets. It's like, it's like the friendliest creature. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, they'll domesticate us but, so that yes, we will be exactly. lap pets to them. Yes. I mean, or something strange is going to happen. They'll keep the docile humans and get rid of the violent ones, and then yeah. breed the docile humans. Yeah, I mean, the utility function of the digital superintelligence is of stupendous importance. Yeah. What does it try to optimize? And we need to be really careful with saying, oh, well, how about human happiness? Because it, you know, it may conclude that all unhappy humans should be terminated, and uh, you know, all that we should all be just be captured and with dopamine and serotonin directly injected into our brains to maximize. Happiness. happiness, because it's concluded that dopamine and serotonin are what cause happiness. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, maximize. <that. laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying we should uh, exercise caution. I'm quite optimistic about the future. I mean, I don't think we're about to enter a dark age. It could happen, but it's not. I think not likely anytime soon. Not but before I, you get to Mars. Hopefully, not before we get to Mars. <laughs> But bear in mind that, that... And part of the act of trying to get to Mars is a force to keep us out of the Dark Ages. I mean, there's always a chance that something calamitous could happen to Earth, uh, either a natural or man-made catastrophe. Certainly we see that in the fossil record. And we've invented all sorts of ways of, of doing ourselves in that the dinosaurs didn't have. And we haven't managed to solve the asteroid problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> therefore, our risk is higher, okay? <laughs> sure people realize this. If you haven't solved the problems that have caused the prior extinctions and you've added new ones, <laughs> you've not improved the situation. <laughs> and that's sort of where we are right now. And, so, and you know, there, there are people, there are some really smart people that are a lot more pessimistic than I am, like, you know, the Stephen Hawking's of the world and the Martin Rees, the Royal Astronomy. They're all quite pessimistic. I'm a naturally optimistic person, but I do think that there's value in establishing life insurance, which, if life as we know it is on more than one planet, then... Um